and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today, I am going to discuss Delhi edition dated 4th May 2018 of The Hindu. So let's begin. We will discuss this article that appears on page 13 and it reads, AIIB not a threat can cooperate, says ADB president. So with the help of this article today, we will try to understand about AIIB which stands for Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So in the past in prelims exam in UPSC, many times questions have been asked about such multilateral banks. For example, in prelims 2016, two questions were asked pertaining to international institutions. First was related to the New Development Bank and second was related to International Monetary and Financial Committee. So in this respect, we should also know some important points about AIIB. So the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is a multilateral development bank which aims to support the development of infrastructure in the Asia-Pacific region. This bank started its operations in 2016. This bank was proposed as an initiative by China and its headquarters are located in Beijing, China. AIIB currently has 64 member states and 20 prospective members. So the total approved members of AIIB is 84. The next point that you should know about AIIB is that India was a founding member of AIIB and India is also the second largest shareholder in AIIB. Also, India is going to host the third annual meeting of AIIB in June 2018. And lastly, you should know about the focus areas of AIIB. These focus areas are rural infrastructure, energy and power, environment protection, transportation and telecom, urban development and logistics. So I hope with the help of this discussion you have understood about some key points about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank which is a multilateral development bank that started its operations in 2016. The main aim of this bank is to support the development of infrastructure in the Asia Pacific region. Its headquarters are in Beijing, China. As of now, it has 64 member states and 20 prospective members such that its total approved membership is 84. India is one of the founding members of AIIB and it is also the second largest shareholder in AIIB. Also, India is going to host the third annual meeting of AIIB in June 2018. And lastly, we understood what are the focus areas of this bank. These are rural infrastructure, energy and power, environment protection, transportation and telecommunication and urban development and logistics. So AIIB is an important international institution and you should remember all these points from your prelims exam point of view. With this, we will move on to the next article. The next article that we will discuss appears on page 9 and it reads Emerging Irritant. This topic talks about the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and it forms a part of GS Paper 2 under the heading Bilateral, Regional and Global Groupings which affect India's interests. Also a question pertaining to this has been asked previously in the UPSC mains exam which said China and Pakistan have entered into an agreement for development of an economic corridor. What threat does it pose for India's security critically examine? So the main focus of this article is that the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPEC will remain a thorn in India-Pakistan relations. This is because the CPEC violates India's sovereignty and territorial integrity and no country can accept a project that ignores its core concerns on sovereignty and territorial integrity. So this shows the China-Pakistan corridor affects India's interests and it is also affecting India's relations with Pakistan. So we will discuss a few key points that are discussed in this article which talk about the negative fallout of CPEC on India. So as you all must be knowing that the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor will be passing through the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir area 
and China's insistence on establishing the CPEC through the Pakistan occupied Kashmir area is a deliberate disregard of India's territorial claims and it hampers India's sovereign claim over Pakistan occupied Kashmir area. The second point discussed in this article which talks about the negative fallout of CPEC on India says that China's heavy investment in this region risks the fact that China will become a party to the Indo-Pakistan dispute over POK. Next, the article says that CPEC increases the dependence of China on Pakistan and thereby it fortifies the China-Pakistan axis and this will hamper India's bilateral relations with China. The author in this article has also highlighted that if CPEC's potential success makes the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir area more industrially developed, then this will grant Pakistan greater legitimacy over the Kashmir region. And the last point mentioned in this article is that India currently does not have much power leeway over the CPEC other than diplomatic protests against the CPEC. So with the help of this discussion, we have understood many key points about the impact of China-Pakistan economic corridor on India's sovereignty as well as India's relations with China and Pakistan. The article says that CPEC will affect India-Pakistan relations because this corridor violates India's sovereignty and territorial integrity. For this, the author has given various reasons pertaining to the negative fallout of CPEC on India. The author says that China's insistence on establishing CPEC through the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir area is a deliberate disregard of India's territorial claims over this area and it hampers India's sovereign claim over the POK region. Next, the author says that China's heavy investment in this region risks the fact that China can become party to India-Pakistan dispute over POK. Thirdly, CPEC increases the dependence of China on Pakistan and it will fortify the China-Pakistan axis which may hamper India's relations with China. The next point is that if CPEC's success makes the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir area more industrially developed, then it will give Pakistan a greater legitimacy over the POK region. And lastly, the article says that India currently does not have much power leeway over CPEC except diplomatic protests against CPEC. So I hope with this discussion you have understood about the impact of the development of the China-Pakistan economic corridor on India's national interests. And you should read this article from the mains exam point of view. With this, we will move on to the next article. The next article that we'll discuss appears on page 8 and it reads, A Pattern of Impunity. This topic forms a part of GS Paper 2 under the heading, Mechanisms, Laws, Institutions and Bodies constituted for the protection and betterment of vulnerable sections. So mainly this article talks about the failure of the criminal justice system in India to recognize its own casteist bias. And this according to the author is the main problem in the implementation of the SCST Act. So the author has tried to explain this by giving reference to the Subhash Kashinath Mahajan versus the state of Maharashtra case based on which the Supreme Court has diluted the provisions of this SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act. So let's understand what the Supreme Court has done pertaining to this SCST Act. So the Supreme Court on the basis of the Subhash Kashinath Mahajan versus state of Maharashtra case has expanded the ambit of the case and diluted the provisions of the SCST Act. According to the Supreme Court, the poor conviction rates and high acquittal rates in cases pertaining to SCSTs implies that most of these cases are false cases. And this, according to the Supreme Court, has led to the misuse of the SCST Act. So, the Supreme Court has laid down three guidelines which dilute the provisions of the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act. Firstly, the Supreme Court has removed the bar on grant of anticipatory bail. 
secondly the supreme court has ruled that in cases where the accused is a non public servant the police may make an arrest only after the approval by a senior superintendent of police and thirdly the supreme court has held that before registering an fir in cases pertaining to the scst act the police may conduct a preliminary inquiry to ascertain the veracity of the complaint so let's revise what we have understood till now that the supreme court on the basis of the subhash kashinath mahajan versus state of maharashtra case has expanded the ambit of the case and diluted the provisions of the scst act according to the supreme court poor conviction rates and high acquittal rates in the cases that pertain to this scst act implies that there are a high number of false cases and according to the supreme court this has led to the misuse of this act as a result three guidelines have been given by the supreme court pertaining to this which state that the supreme court has removed the bar on the grant of anticipatory bail secondly supreme court has ruled that if the accused is a non public servant then the police can make an arrest only after approval of a senior superintendent of police and lastly supreme court has held that before registering an fir police may conduct a preliminary enquiry in order to check the veracity of the complaint and this according to the author has led to the dilution of the provisions of the scst prevention of atrocities act now let's understand what has been the impact of these three guidelines by the supreme court according to the author after the passage of these guidelines instead of immediately registering an fir the police will now immediately doubt the dalit person and instead of investigating the accused the police may now investigate the complaint of the dalit person to check its veracity and this according to the author is not right and it is not the objective of the scst act the author has also highlighted the importance of the scst act for the dalits the author has said that the scst act and the scst amendment act hold enormous significance for dalits because they have been effective in protecting them from caste injustice and at the same time the author says that the existence of this act proves that dalits face injustice in a heavily casteist society and this act is a powerful affirmation of the dalit community's faith in the indian constitution hence after looking at these points the author has concluded that the problem with this law is not the supposed misuse of the scst act but the inability of the indian criminal justice system to recognize its own casteist bias so after discussing the guidelines that have been passed by the supreme court pertaining to the scst act the author is talked about the impact of these guidelines author says that instead of registering an fir now the police may doubt the dalit and the police may start investigating the complaint of the dalit to check its veracity instead of investigating the accused in such cases and lastly the author has highlighted the importance of the scst act for the dalits this act protects the dalits from caste injustice and protects them from a casteist society the presence of this act is an affirmation of the dalit community's faith in the indian constitution hence the author says that the problem does not lie with the scst act but the problem lies in the casteist bias in the criminal justice system of the country so i hope you have understood all the key points and the author's view point pertaining to the guidelines that have been passed by the supreme court for the scst act and you should refer to these points from the mains exam point of view with this we will move on to the next article The next important article appears on page 8 and it reads targeting Tehran. So the main focus of this article is the recent revelations by Israel on the Iran nuclear program and according to the article the revelations made by Israel do not provide a strong evidence to junk the Iran nuclear deal by the United States. Also as I've discussed it earlier in one DNS video 
that this revelation by Israel coincides with the upcoming decision of President Donald Trump to decide whether US will approve the Iran nuclear deal or not. So this article provides reasons as to why there is no strong evidence to junk the Iran nuclear deal. Firstly, the article says that the problem with Israel's revelation is that it relates to the Iran nuclear program which was before the Iran nuclear deal or which was a pre-nuclear deal program. Thus, it means that the revelations by Israel do not provide an indication that Iran has violated the terms of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is an international agreement that has been signed between Iran and five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council and Germany. So the article says that this revelation made by Israel based on the documents that it seized from Iran creates more problem for Israel as compared to Iran. This is because since the Israeli documents show that Iran had a nuclear program but it has ended that nuclear program after the nuclear deal was signed, this only bolsters the argument in favor of the Iranian deal. Hence, the article says that if US under the influence of Israel decides to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal, then there is no credible evidence for United States to do so and this may lead to revoking of the nuclear deal which is the only barrier that is halting the Iran nuclear program. So let's revise what we have understood from this article. This article talks about the revelations that have been made by Israel on the Iranian nuclear program and the article says that these revelations or these documents that have been seized by Israel do not provide a strong evidence to junk the Iran nuclear deal by the United States. And as you already know that the timing of this revelation coincides with the upcoming decision of President Trump to decide United States approval of the Iran nuclear deal. Now why these revelations will not provide a strong evidence? Many reasons have been given for this. Firstly, the revelations relate to an Iran nuclear program which was before the Iran nuclear deal or which was pre-nuclear deal. Hence, it does not provide an indication that Iran has violated the terms of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And these revelations thus create more problem for Israel compared to Iran. This is because the Israeli documents show that Iran had a nuclear program but Iran ended that program after the nuclear deal was signed. So this only bolsters the above argument in favor of the Iranian deal. So the article states that now if United States pulls out of the Iran nuclear deal, then there is no credible evidence for United States to do so. And if it does pull out of the nuclear deal, then it may revoke the nuclear deal. And this is the only barrier that is preventing the Iran nuclear program as of now. So I hope you have understood all these points pertaining to the Iran nuclear program and the Iran nuclear deal. As of now, this news is in transition and we would have to wait for the United States decision on the Iran nuclear deal on 12th of May. With this, we will move on to the next article. The next article we discuss appears on page 11 and it reads, Birth pangs of a lifeline fall on deaf ears. Now this article talks about the Kaveri water dispute and it says that the Kaveri issue has become a political issue between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. However, not enough attention is being paid to the ecological crisis that is happening at the place of origin of the Kaveri river. So this article basically emphasizes the ecological crisis or the ecological impact that is being faced in the place of origin of Kaveri. So I hope you all know that the place of origin of the Kaveri river is Tal Kaveri in the Kodagu district of Karnataka. So with the help of this article we will understand the ecological crisis at the place of origin of the Kaveri river. Firstly the water availability in the region is being adversely affected and this is mainly due to rapid commercialization, uncontrolled tourism, changes in agricultural practices and climate change. Secondly, there is a heavy inflow of tourists in this area 
and most of the farmland is being diverted for commercial purposes and this is obviously having a negative ecological impact at the place of origin of kaveri river thirdly developmental activities like construction of transmission lines have resulted in extensive tree cutting in the area leading to deforestation also even though the kodagu district is a water rich district still open wells in this hilly district went dry during the previous monsoon another important point that has been highlighted is that one of the major reasons that is affecting the availability of water in this district is the loss of is the loss of traditional paddy fields and how is this happening so basically the growing of paddy has a sponge effect that is the soil absorbs the water and increases the ground water level and this water that percolates in the soil from the paddy fields recharges several rivulets that eventually join the kaveri river however what is actually happening is that there has been a decline in the paddy growing area by about 40% this is because farmers feel that growing paddy is not as profitable and hence they are moving towards commercial crops so with the help of this discussion we have understood about the kaveri river water dispute from an ecological point of view we have talked about the ecological crisis that is happening at the place of origin of the kaveri river firstly water availability is being adversely affected in the kodagu district which is the place of origin of the kaveri river mainly due to rapid commercialization uncontrolled tourism changes in agricultural practices and climate change there is a heavy inflow of tourists and most of the farmland has been diverted away for commercial purposes also due to development activities such as laying of transmission lines has led to cutting of trees in this area in a water rich district like kodagu and the open wells went dry in this district during the previous monsoon season another reason which is adversely affecting the water availability in this district is the loss of traditional paddy fields as you must be knowing that paddy growing has a sponge effect that is it increases the ground water level and as a result it recharges several rivulets that further join into the kaveri river however there has been a decrease in the paddy growing in this district mainly because the farmers are moving towards commercial crops so all these points highlight the ecological aspect of this river water dispute a suggestion that has been provided in this article pertaining to this loss of traditional paddy fields is that in order to revive paddy farming in this district the study has suggested a method of payment for ecological services which means that in order to attract the farmers to increase paddy cultivation some incentive should be provided to them for protecting the ecology thereby sacrificing their commercial interests since this river water dispute has been in the news for some time it's important from the upsc exam point of view with this we come to an end to today's newspaper discussion now let's move on to question for the day